at a really beautiful location. Of course, I haven't seen much so far, but this will come. And um, I'm really happy to be here in person this year. So what I will do today, I think this doesn't work. I will write with you through the potential energy surface on the famous SMU Mustangs. So maybe not all of you know SMU. Oops. We are located in the heart of Dallas on a very beautiful campus. Michael, I think you remember that, right? So because he joined us there. And this is our workhorse. Um, Mainframe 2, a supercomputer, gives us a lot of core memory for our investigations. And we are very excited because uh, a month ago, we also got an NVIDIA SuperPod. So we are very well equipped. Some background about CATCO. CATCO was originally formed in 1980. Uh, by Dieter Kramer at the University of Cologne. Then the group moved to Sweden, then to California. And since 2009, SMU is our home. I also should mention that since 2017, in addition to the traditional PhD program in experimental chemistry, we offer now a degree in theoretical and computational chemistry, a fast track. We are guaranteeing a PhD in four years. And uh, this is connected also to SMU's Center for Research Computation. The application are currently open. So please spread the word. And we are also interested in joint PhD programs. So for example, we just have now the first student from the University of Turin who gets a dual PhD, one at SMU and one in Italy. And here you see the current CATCO members and associates which work with me on a variety of different topics stretching from catalysis to computer-assisted drug design. And maybe those of you who joined the meeting last year, you might remember last year, I was talking about the local mode analysis. So this year I will focus on catalysis and the unified reaction valley approach. So what is URVA? URVA describes a chemical reaction like in a mountain range by following the reaction path traced out by the reaction complex. But in addition, we also describe the reaction valley close to the reaction path. So we are very strongly connected to vibrational spectroscopy. And the key feature is that the reaction path is not a straight line, it is curved. And analyzing now almost more than 900 reactions, we found that there where the path is curved, the chemistry happens. So describing a reaction system with one large amplitude motion and the perpendicular valley goes back originally to Rudy Marcus, who used this for his natural collision coordinates. And then in 1980, Miller, Handy and Adams picked up the same idea in their reaction path Hamiltonian. So it's very difficult to point with a mouse. Um, there you see again, you have one coordinate along the reaction path and conjugated momentum. And in addition, you have the normal coordinates 3n minus 7 perpendicular and the conjugated momenta. Whenever you have two sorts of coordinates, there is coupling. And what is very essential to this approach are these so-called curvature coupling elements because they monitor how this motion couples along the reaction path. And here in a nutshell, you see what is happening. If you have electronic structure change, some normal modes change, the coupling 
coupling with a motion along the path changes. And as Miller, Handy, and Adams proved in their seminal work, these coupling terms define the curving of the rection path. So that means curving of the path is connected to electronic structure change. What do we get if we plot the curvature, the magnitude of the curvature as a function of S and don't confuse this with an energy profile. It's the curvature profile. I think I will use this pointer here. Then you see you get, so to speak, a fingerprint of a chemical reaction. You get minima where not much is happening and you get the maxima and we can use this in order to then dissect a chemical reaction in meaningful chemical reaction phases. And so the question is, how do we calculate the curvature? In the beginning, I calculated uh, the curvature via the coupling coefficients. Not a good idea because there is no analytical solution. So what we do now is we calculate the curvature by using Mars weighted Cartesian coordinates, gradients, and the Hessians. We also have um, now an improved way to follow the reaction path. This is very important because if you want to move out into the entrance and exit channel, the potential energy surface becomes very flat. So you need a very robust following procedure. In order to get even more information, what we do is we decompose the scalar curvature into components. And by this doing so, we get a detailed information about which chemical event is, for example, uh, made up by a breaking of a bond and so on, because these components can be bond lengths, bond angles, dihedral angles, but also puckering coordinates and so on. I also should mention only events before the transition states are important for the activation energy. And here are the formulas, how we derive the decomposition into components components, but maybe because you are all longing for the coffee break, if you are really interested in the math, please refer to this paper. Now I will show you some examples. Let's start with small molecules out in space. How do they react? So we got very attracted into Titan, which is the moon of Saturn because it has an atmosphere and the gravity like on Earth. The only problem is it's a little colder. So maybe not a good place to move there. Um, Cassini mission, which ended in 2017, they did a lot of measurements and they detected protonated hydrogen methylene amine cation most likely be uh, from methane, which you find there, and atomic nitrogen, and also some intermediates. So the question for us was, how can we find the mechanism starting from here, ending up at the product and catching these intermediates? One of my PhD students, thought, oh, this is a piece of cake, just some small molecules. But of course, you have to consider some of the molecules are in singlet, doublet, and triplet states. So it took her about five months to figure out the whole story, which you see here. So uh, what we detected was starting from here, in order to get to the products, there are three possible paths, in total, eight different reaction paths connecting them. And I will just show you a couple of those. So let's look at this path here. There you see now our curvature. What is important in this reaction, this bond has to be broken. And here is the movie, how it works.
And this is the second reaction where now we have an isomerization. Again, if we have a bond breaking event, which determines the peak here. And there you see how the isomerization proceeds. Next, we have to lose a hydrogen atom. Again, this is one of the dominant peaks. So here you see how the hydrogen atom moves away. And now we have to lose another hydrogen to get to the C and triple bond. This is the hydrogen from the nitrogen. And as you see here in the movie, the hydrogen cannot decide to leave. It is first roaming around the system. And then finally, to get to the final product, this is a linear system. So we have to go back now to a CN double bond. There are a lot of events, but this is the most important starting point, the bending of the system, and then the addition of the hydrogen molecule. And you see here when the hydrogen molecule is approaching, the system bends, it attaches the hydrogen molecule, and then one of the hydrogen atoms flips around. So in this way, we learn a lot. What we also can do is we can complement the over analysis with our local mode analysis. If you are interested, we just published a feature article about that. And what we learn here is because local modes lead to an assessment of bond strengths. On Titan, there are CN bonds of different strengths, weak ones, single bonds, double bonds, and triple bonds. So a lot of material for maybe forming amino acids. Now I will present you a challenge from catalysis. The Sharpless epoxidation reaction, which has been connected to past and present Nobel Prizes. And here you see how it works. The goal is an anxioselective synthesis of two, three epoxy alcohols. These are the ingredients, peroxide, allylic alcohol, and a titanium for dimer as catalysts. And you see here, this looks almost like a surface. And what the titanium metal does, it attracts the hydrogen peroxide. And then it channels this oxygen here on top of the CC bond to be attacked in order to form the CO bonds. And this is the profile and the catalyst is very effective. It reduces the barrier by more than 100%. And to our surprise, the curvature diagram is pretty simple. Here is the main event, breakage of the OO bond. And after the transition state, the two CO bonds are synchronously formed, keeping the stereochemistry. So to summarize, both ends of the peroxide are coordinated to the titanium, which helps already to weaken the bonds to be broken. And then it channels one of the oxygens in the right position to attack the CC double bond. Now the next question, can we do this for biochemistry and drug design? Yes, we can do over analysis of QMMM. The only problem we have to keep in mind, the dimension of the path of the whole system, unfortunately is not only determined by the QM atoms, it's determined by all atoms. So for example, here, this was our first study, the um, Corismate mutation to prefinate 
catalyzed by corismate mutase. There we had to deal with 5,000 atoms and with 15,000 times 15,000 Hessians, so which is huge, but it worked. The calculations took about four months and we could prove for the first time the catalytic effect is due to space confinement supported by the electrostatic field of the protein. Currently, we are interested in alpha keto amide inhibitors for SARS. There is one main protease which is involved in the replication of the virus. What we could show is the inhibitor forms a chemical bond with the protein at cysteine 145, a CS bond. And now the target is to make this bond as strong as possible. And here are the energetics compared to the gas phase. The barrier goes down a little bit. What is more interesting is the reaction energetics. In the gas phase, the reaction is endothermic. In the protein, it's strongly exothermic. Remember, this is what we want because we want to have a product with a strong CS bond. And here you see the corresponding ORVA analysis. In the gas phase, SH bond breakage, completion of CS bond and OH bond, everything happens before the transition state. In the protein, here the CS bond is before the transition state, but the rest asynchronously after the transition state. And here this is a little small slide complemented with the local mode analysis, what we can say is in the gas phase, the CS bond is weakest and the longest, a long way to go, which is much shorter in the protein. That means we have space confinement. And if we compare the two forms, the epsilon or delta histidine form, then we can see that the CS bond is stronger in the delta form. This is all important information for drug designers. Finally, I would like to share one curiosity we had inspired by the Hohenberg-Cohn theorem. So we were asking the question, do electron density changes which reflect bond breaking and bond forming occur at the position or in the vicinity of our curvature peaks, because according to Hohenberg-Cohn, this is how it should be. So for this purpose, we analyze 10 reactions, starting very simple, getting more complex. And then of course, the next thing what you need is how do we assess when a bond is broken or formed in the electron density? And we followed Bader's suggestion to use the Laplacian and the valence shell charge concentration overlap. So the VSCC. Here you see when a bond starts to be formed, you have here a starting point of this overlap. When the bond starts to be broken, the overlap disappears. And let's take a look at a simple reaction, CH3 plus H2. We call these points E points. There you see we have an E point exactly when in our curvature, the CH bond becomes supportive, the CH bond forms. This is this point here. The second point E2 we find here where the HH finally is broken. And this is a more complex reaction, the 1,3 dipolar addition of acetylene and fulminic acid. The E1 point occurs at the onset of CC bond formation here. And the second E point occurs at the formation of the OCO bond. So that means, yes, significant electron density changes occur before or at our curvature peaks, and we can use the curvature peaks in this way 
as a guideline for locating important electron density changes. And now this is the program. So all what you need, we call this a browsing file. You need to store energy, get these in coordinates, gradient and hessian at each point along the path. Or alternatively, if you have a large QMMM, we cannot store the hessian anymore. So we calculate the path direction and the curvature on the fly. This is the input for the P Orva program written in Python. It produces then all the data along the direction, movies, and also does a lot of pre-processing. So if you want to give it a try, send me an email and we will send you the program. Currently, the browsing file is incorporated in Gaussian where we also have this good following. But of course, you can also use other programs. And if you are interested in the local mode analysis, again, just send me an email and we will send you the code. And this is still in Fortran 90. And so with that, I would like to finish my presentation by giving my thanks to the agencies and in particular to the SMU High Performance Computer Center. And I would like to thank you, and I hope I pronounce it right, Kamsha Hamnida. Yes, correct. Thank you. <laughs> OK, questions, please? OK, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, um, this path is uh, set up in a way that the angular momentum changes are incorporated also in the curvature. There are two sorts of curvatures. I only talked about the ones um, concerning the path, but there are also curvature coupling elements between the motions perpendicular to the path, and they pick up these rotations. Um, Michael first. Yes. All right. Uh, very nice presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, in your uh, approach, Urva, you need to know uh, Hessian at each point of the path. Yes. Uh, is it not possible to uh, update Hessian approximately, starting from some ex exact value, so to speak, and then uh, making several steps to update it by power update, lecture power, whatever, and then maybe recalculate that reduce mm -hmm. in the computation. Yeah, this course. is actually what we are doing for larger systems. Mm -hmm. So we calculate, let's say we have a, a step size, a given step size, and, and then for three or four steps, we update the Hessian and then we recalculate it again. Uh, a project which will start soon is currently we are using a fixed step size. Mm -hmm but we would like to use a flexible step size, maybe even using artificial intelligence to recognize. So nothing is happening all at once. There is a curvature peak. Mm. Then you should use a smaller step size. Mm. If you are behind the curvature peak, you can use a larger step size again. This of course would save a lot of computer time. Right, and maybe also some other questions. Um, you compute your surfaces by quantum chemical methods, right? Uh, maybe some simpler approach could be to scan these surfaces and then uh, build some kind of machine learned representation of the surfaces and use them for analysis of the reaction path. Did, did you consider such a possibility? Uh, when I started uh, my postdoc, um in the Dunning group, uh, mm -hmm. we were doing OH plus H2, the first molecule to check this out. Unfortunately, his program didn't have gradients and hessians. And so what I had to do is I first had to calculate a grid of points, fit um, then the grid, and then do it from, from there. Yes, it's a possibility. Um, I would rather like to go in a direction using semi-empirical DFT methods mm -hmm. um, in order to do then the points more uh, quickly. But it's possible, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you. Sergey, next, sorry. 
All right. So uh, for the applications you you showed, um, I'm I'm curious. So since you have oxygen and nitrogens there and bonds breaking, so is there possibility of having low line triplet state crossing the singlet state and that's affecting the reaction parts? Yes. You have, you have to be careful. We are uh, currently still in the von Oppenheimer approximation. So even for uh, this Titan work, we made sure that uh, something like this doesn't happen. But what you also can do is, for example, you can calculate a singlet path, and then you can calculate the triplet path, and then you can see if you have some crossing. John? Yeah. I mean, what what we have done a poor man's approach. So, f for example, um, you you can just. Um, put the temperature in your normal mode analysis, right? You can do the normal mode analysis and then you, you can do it at a different temperature, but using the path you have uh, from the start. Of course, it would be nice um, to have the whole system set up in a way So, I mean, normally um, you can do a normal mode analysis at zero Kelvin or you can do it at room temperature, right? And then you can also do it. Yeah, yeah. Right, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, yes, yes. 